Hello and welcome to the Lightboard session. In this lesson, I am going to narrate to you the story of containers as I saw it. And as most of you think that Docker is where the story of containers started, uh, that's definitely not true. It began much earlier, in, in fact, in 1970s, when the Charoot was introduced. Now with Charoot, Charoot was a Linux utility, Unix utility, and with Charoot, what you could do was even if you're not a root user, you could, in your home directory, you could switch your root and become actually sort of an admin in that restricted area. It was more or less like a file system, namespace that we call in today's world. And that was the beginning of it all. But it was not as sophisticated as it is today. Uh, later, in around 2001 and uh, between 2001 and 2004 was when uh, Solaris came with its own zones. So you had Solaris with zones and uh, we had BSDs with something called as jails. So Solaris had zones, BSD came up with its own mechanism called as zones, which is very similar to what we call as Linux containers. The only thing about containers in general is, uh, and this is also called as operating system virtualization. So the te technology involved in operating system virtualization restricts you to run, let's say, a Solaris on top of Solaris, or it could be a BSD on top of BSD here. You cannot run a Linux container on top of Solaris or BSDs, or you, can, you cannot run uh, Linux in a Solar BSD jail and Solaris zone and vice versa. Now what came to, you know, uh, Linux initially was, uh, there was a company called as uh, Virtuzo who created their open source version of container system called as Open Virtuzo, so Open VZ, that's what they called it. Now around 2007, when I got to try this, uh, Open VZ, the thing about that was even though you could run Linux containers with it, it was quite complex. And then, you had to recompile the kernel in order to use OpenVZ. Uh, you had no ecosystem, so you had to build your own images, distribute them yourself. Uh, you, there was no container orchestration engine like Kubernetes or anything on similar lines. So using and running it in production was a challenge. Not a lot of takers in 2005. Now what was also happening on the other side of the world in 2005 was uh, Google had built their own cluster manager, and Google had started migrating their workloads to containers somewhere around 2003, 2004 timeline. And they, what they created was a cluster manager called as Borg. We talk about Docker in 2012, and Google has been using and running their applications on top of containers in production environments since 2004. Isn't that fantastic, right? And what Google also did was as part of creating and running this Borg system, uh, they created something, uh, a feature of Linux kernel where you could isolate the process and not isolate the process, that was namespaces, but you could restrict the resources for a container. So resource restriction, resource management became easier and what they contributed to the Linux kernel, uh, the Linux kernel was called as uh, C groups later. They created something called as process groups to restrict the CPU, memory, and all of that and uh, for a container. And that was created and contributed back to the kernel. So by 2008, C groups, along with another important feature called as namespaces, became the core part of the Linux kernel. And on top of that, in the same year, 2008, this was in 2008, so let me write it with a different color. And in 2008, what came out of this was a software called as LXC. Now, a lot of companies started leveraging LXC and they started building their solutions on top of LXC. One such company 
who was founded, I believe, in 2009. They had raised some fundings and they were trying to build a product using this Alexi as one of the features of their products. So what they had was a browser-based collaboration tool. So through your browser, you could have an IDE you, and you could write the code here. And then in another terminal, you could execute it as well. Now that feature where you could execute the code in a terminal using a Linux shell was built on top of LXC actually. So it comes from here. And this company was named as DotCloud. So DotCloud has raised funding and by let's say around 2012, what happened was um, this product probably did not fly, did, was not making a lot of money for them. So by the 2012, the end of that, uh, you know, they were almost running out of funds. They were almost on the verge of bankruptcy and that's when the founder of .cloud brought his team together and what they decided to do was open source the technology that they were using to run this terminal which was based on top of LXE and they named it as project as you might have guessed it docker and rest is the history after they open sourced it it became very, very popular very quickly and .cloud was renamed to Docker Inc. Uh, later in, I believe, in 2013 and rest is the history that you already are aware of. Now, people started talking about Docker uh, around 2013, it got really popular and then a lot of people started experimenting using Docker and that's when, that was the year when I started with Docker because I was building, um, you know, a big data infrastructure and automating it and we were using a lot of VMs for that. At that time, we were using Vagrant, which was an automation tool, but at, even though we were using Vagrant, Docker, using Docker was a much faster process. So a lot of people started experimenting with Docker and found, a, a, you know, it very, being a very interesting tool. Now, some of them also started thinking about, hey, it is great for development. It is much faster and lighter than the VMs. How can we leverage this and run our applications in production? Uh, that was around 2013-14. In the same year, probably Google would have thought uh, internally, some of the developers in Google uh, thought about this and uh, they came up with an idea that, hey, we've been doing this for like, you know, almost like eight years now. Why don't we simplify and probably do the world a favor and uh, simplify the process of running containers in, uh, you know, in production and give them everything that is needed in order to do that. And what they came up with was an internal project called as 7 of 9, which was uh, their, their cluster manager was called as Borg. So Borg is a Star Trek character and there is a friendly Borg called as 7, on, seven of 9. And they decided, I mean, they had named it as 709, but when they released that product in 2014, that's when they called it as Kubernetes. And that is how Kubernetes was born. Now, in 2014, Kubernetes was released. By around 2014 to 15, um, Docker has released its own orchestration engine called as Swarm. Also, Mesos, which was a hybrid orchestration engine which had been popular since around 2009, uh, they had released their own orchestration piece uh, and they had their orchestration piece, uh, you know, they had DCOS on top of that, they would run their orchestrator and to submit different types of jobs, you could run, let's say, container jobs with, you know, the orchestration I'm, in, I'm going to talk about. Uh, you could run a Hadoop job along the same time and a cron job and a Jenkins job and a Spark job and to submit each of these jobs, they had these frameworks. So they created a framework for submitting the containers, container-based workloads and they called it as Marathon. That's why when you talk about Mesos, you call it in, in, in the context of containers, it is Mesos plus Marathon. And uh, this happened around 2014 to 15, but in 2016 and between 16 and 18, uh, Kubernetes really matured as a gold standard for container orchestration. Uh, in those years, 2016 and 17, Kubernetes released a lot of interesting features really fast. Uh, it gathered a you know huge community around it. In 2017, mid of that, AWS launched 
AWS and Azure, around the same time, they launched the managed services, namely EKS and AKS. Azure Kubernetes Service and EC2 Containers, uh, Container Service. In fact, both of them had their own orchestration engines, uh, but they were sort of forced to launch it because Kubernetes was quickly evolving as a gold standard and everybody, even, they, uh, even if they had their own orchestration, um, you know, a lot of companies would just use the infrastructure services and set up Kubernetes on top of that. So that became sort of more like a gold standard. And once cloud started adopting it, uh, there were smaller clouds like DigitalOcean who also launched a you know Kubernetes service somewhere last year as well, right? So if you look at today's world, Kubernetes has emerged as the gold standard in the world of container orchestration. Along with that, you typically what you run and what you orchestrate in Docker containers, but it is also with Kubernetes, it is also possible to replace, there is a interface that Kubernetes has built called a CRI. With that, it's pluggable interface. So you can you know, use Docker or you can use Rocket or you can use just you know, um, the run C. Uh, so you can actually replace one with another. It's a pluggable infrastructure today. So who knows what happens and how it evolves in future? That's something to see. So there's also a cryo interface. Um, you know, that's a container runtime uh, engine as well. So this is how we came from the Charut to you know the Solaris and BSTs, they had their own system to open VZ to LXC to Docker in around 2012 and Kubernetes in 2014. And when we talk about this in you know late 2019 and 2020 today, um, Docker and Kubernetes are pretty much the standard in the world of container orchestration. And it's important to know how this really evolved, and that was the purpose of this lesson. I hope you found this useful.